Hello, hello, welcome back to my channel, everyone. In this video, we will be reading Soiled Doves Prostitution in the Early West by Anne Seen Graves. We will be reading chapter seven, which is A Little Affection, Please. Um, I've already read a page of this. Um, it is going to be very dark right off the bat. So, fair warning, proceed at your own con um, <laughs> at your own risk. Um, but let's start with the, the photo to the left, which is the life of the Western prostitute. Often was one of degradation and despair. Uh, Timothy Golden Collection, Missoula, Montana. And we have a woman to here not looking her brightest. All right, and with that, we will begin a l chapter seven, a little affection, please. It has been said that social disease and unwanted pregnancy were the occupational hazards of prostitution, but in reality, it was loneliness. The soiled doves, by her own choice, cut herself off from her family and was isolated by society. Her rights as a citizen were also removed, since she worked outside of the law, she had no protection. If the women had children, they too were considered outcasts. Her constant moves from one location to another, and many sexual partners or husbands, dramatically affected her children's lives. It was a harsh world for them, where existence was a constant struggle. The daughter of a prostitute often followed in her mother's footsteps. She was usually illiterate and had a little contact with the outside world. Prostitution was familiar to her and she did what she, what was natural. The majority of these girls entered the profession at an early age. By the time they were in their mid twenties, most of them had become offensive alcoholic drug users. They lived a life of violence with little, if any, affection. On July 7th, 1876, the Rocky Mountain News published the following account of two young girls who were used as prostitutes. A beastly woman was before Justice Whitmore yesterday on a charge of harboring young girls for immoral purposes. And the evidence which is unfit for publication, showed that the woman as well as the males associated with her in this wicked business deserved to be lynched. The men not yet been arrested. The woman who gave her name as Mary Galligan, but who is also known as Adobe Mall, was committed for trial at the district court, the crime being beyond the jurisdiction of justice. One of the two girls decored in Mole's den was a little black girl who some years since lost both her arms and one leg by being run over by the cars. She is about 13 years old and her companion, a white girl, only 11. In many instances, it was the girl's own mother who forced her into prostitution. The June 7th, 1877, Territorial Enterprise in Virginia City, Nevada tells of a 13-year-old girl who was rescued from the brothel of Nellie Sayers. She had been coerced by her mother to drink alcohol and receive men, or have her throat cut. Nellie Sayers, um, Nellie Sayers reputed to kept children in her house and willingly supplied her customers with little girls. Following her removal from the house of prostitution, the child said she hated what she had been forced to do and begged the police to protect her from a woman she accused of being an unnatural mother the newspaper column reported the girl was very small for her age and quite fragile. She says she had not had anything to eat for two days, living constantly only on the liquor she had been forced to drink. There's no doubt that the girl is telling the truth. 
Although the average prostitute provided as well as she could for her children, there were times where she was no longer able to care for them. At, that, at this point, other prostitutes would attempt to help. In most cases, however, the children were placed in a poor farm or an orphanage. Prominent citizens traditionally ignored these heartbreaking situations. Women in prostitution were used to rejection. Their husbands or lovers were a sorry assortment of frontier gamblers, criminals, saloon keepers, or pimps. These men used these women for support and helped push them down even lower in the social structure. They abused the prostitutes both verbally and physically and often went as far to murder them. Molly Forrest, at the age of 22, was one of these unfortunate victims. She was murdered by her husband, Joe Scott, a man with an unsavory reputation and ugly temper. The couple had arrived in Butte, Montana a few days before Molly started working in a dance hall and saloon. Somehow Molly angered Scott. He dragged her off the dance floor and took her above to her prostitute's room where he pulled his gun from his holster and blew half of her beautiful Molly's and blew half of the beautiful Molly's face away. Although she was his only means of support, Scott had killed her in a fit of passion while stunned witnesses watched in horror. There were many Molly Forrests. The prostitute's friends and colleagues were also uncut. She was caught in a situation over which she had little control, with no one to turn to for help. Most of the fallen women were explosive and unpredictable. They would drink to excess or get high on opioids, and then unleash their anger and frustration upon each other. In time of illness or death, however, these same women willingly assumed full responsibility for the care of their associate. When death struck, the women helped to bury their own. Having so little for themselves, they still provided a decent burial for all dreaded going to a lonely potter's field. All of the soiled doves knew their careers were short-lived and few, if any, made plans for a better future. They spent their money on worthless things of little value. Some became so tired of being abused by men that they turned to another woman for tenderness or love. Those who once believed the life of a fancy lady would be filled with thrills and excitement found themselves instead of looking at a foreboding barren future. Many became so tired of being victimized, they took it upon themselves to end by suicide. Lottie Abel's picket was one of these women. She was an unstable person who appeared to be running from something, always driven onto new scenes and new ventures. She traveled the mining towns of Montana. When Lottie arrived in Helena, in the mining town of Montana, um, she arrived in the 1870s. She was given the nickname of Sorrel Mike. After a racehorse that was brought to the territory about the same time. Although there are no photos of Lottie, it was said she was an attractive dancer and prostitute with dark auburn hair and a gentle demeanor. Whatever sorrow Mark felt inside, she kept to herself and presented it a gay and to her friends and colleagues. A gay meaning a gay happy face, meaning a cheerful outer appearance. There is no evidence of a pimp in her life, so Lottie no doubt worked alone, occasionally taking a temporary job in a high-class brothel. She was admired by many men and obviously had no problem satisfying their needs. No one, however, knew what private despair filled Lottie's heart. Perhaps she became tired of selling her body and wanted a love that would provide tenderness for herself. She eventually moved to Butte. Lottie was still running, 
On August 28, 1879, Dr. C.P. Howe of Butte was called at 2 a.m. to rescue a fair lady from the jaws of death. This wasn't the first time a doctor had been summoned to help Lottie Ables, for she had been on the verge of death by her own hand more than once already. It became in Helena and in Butte her death was, wish continued. The Butte Daily Miner reported, the doctor promptly repaired to the bedside of the sufferer whom he found far gone in a, in a stupor preceding death by opium poisoning. The lady, Mrs. Pickett, by her legal name, sometimes styled Sorrel Mike by the undervout, became a blushing bride about two weeks ago. Lottie had married a man she barely knew. One who did not come to her as a loving husband. Instead, he was a saloon caper who expected his new wife to continue on with her profession, thus adding to his income. The newspaper continued on with, It is likely that facility of the marriage state was found by experience to fall short of her girlish imagination. During Tuesday to elevate the pains of a toothache, she had pain taken of Londium so liberally that in this evening, when the hour arrived for her to repair the saloon, where her husband earns an honest living by looking, by looking on while his wife dances, it was with great difficulty that she could be sufficiently aroused. Lottie performed that evening, but returned to her lodgings, determined to end her life. She swallowed the remaining laundrium in the vial. Relief was not to be granted, however, for Lottie continued to live on, only to try another time. One year later, Lottie was in the news again. On July 31st, 1880, the Butte Daily Miner dutifully reported Sorrow Mike made up her mind the other day and to go be an angel. And with that intent swallowed an overdose of morphine, it would appear to that newspaper Lottie was an object of ridicule. Following the latest suicide attempt, her husband vanished and she moved into a small town with her sister. It wasn't long before Lottie had a new lover and a new, a new problems. The couple crowed constantly, and once again, Sarah Mike attempted suicide, only this time she was successful. The sister returned home to find Lottie lying on the floor with a bullet in her abdomen. At first, Lottie claimed she had been shot by a man. Later, when she knew death was near, she admitted that she pulled the trigger. The newspaper reporter, Lottie's age being 30 years old, other records show she was only 22 at the time of her death. Either way, it was a very young age for such an unhappy life. Not all fallen women were like Lottie and Abel's Pickett. Many had the courage to stand up and fight the fate they had been dealt, that had, the hand fate had dealt them. Maria Virginia Slade, was one of these women. Her love for the infamous Jack Slade was all-consuming. It became her life. The high-spirited Virginia Slade arrived in Virginia City, Montana in 1863. Her past, like that of the other shady ladies, was obscure. Some said she had been a hurdy-gurdy girl, others a gambling woman but all agreed she had once been a lady of negotiable virtue it is not known how or when the slave met his wife the most popular story being that she had saved his life during a gambling brawl one thing was obvious virginia was happy to be the wife of jack slade for it is doubtful she had ever been loved before Virginia was a talented young woman who blended easily into the wide open town. She was an excellent cook, fine seamstress, and considered the handsomest woman in the Northern Rockies. Her tall, 
<laughs> her tall b-u-x-o-m figure her tall buxom figure flashing eyes and dark raven hair attracted men from near and far but virginia's heart belonged to the only man jack slade this man who she adored had saved her from the sordid life she had once been forced to lead slade was a little red-faced man <laughs> with a a scritcherfinic personality. Scritcherfinic personality. S C H I Z O P H R E N I C. Scritcherfinic personality. He was a hard working freighter when sober and wild demon when drunk. And wild demon when drunk. Although it was rumored that Slade had killed 26 men, there was no proof of that it was true. As a member of the vigilantes, he was the idol of his followers and the terror of his enemies. Jack Slade appeared to be many things and spent his life attempting to live up to the legends people created about him. He was fond of his wife and built her a comfortable rock house eight miles from virginia city in the peaceful meadow valley virginia who had never owned a home before filled it with elegant furnishings which were brought in from salt lake city the couple settled down to share their lives and loves for each other they both enjoyed company and when slade was sober virginia entertained their many friends with gourmet dinners and her warm personality. The Slades also enjoyed dancing at which Virginia excelled. She was always the pride of her husband as well as the most sought after partner on the dance floor. While the other women were wore simple cotton dresses, Virginia appeared in long flowing silk gowns which she created with her own hands. Although she was easily the most popular woman at these affairs, Virginia never angered the other wives. She was a respected member of the community. They both shared a love of horses. Virginia owned a black stallion named Billy Boy, while Slade rode Old Copper Bottom, quote unquote, who never failed to get him home, drunk or sober. The neighbors would often see the slides riding together through the valley in the last of the evening's rays. It was hard being the wife of Jack Slade. Virginia never knew where he was and she prayed daily for his safety. Whether Slade was on a drunken spree or away on business, Virginia patiently waited in her rock house. She could tell by the sound of old copper bottoms hooves if Slade had had too much to drink. On these occasions, she lovingly helped him down off his horse, put him tenderly to bed, and sat by his side until he awoke. In Virginia's eyes, Slade's, Slade could do no wrong. She was not aware that Slade was in trouble with the law, or that the vigilante committee had expelled him due to his drunkenness and danger to public safety. Slade had never been arrested for homicide or for an infraction of the law in Montana, save to disturbing this <laughs> let me try that again slade had never been arrested for homicide or for an infraction of the law in montana save disturbing the peace on march 8th okay on march 8th 1864 the night before the slade was to meet his fate a low moaning wind began to blow throughout the valley virginia sat by her fireplace anxiously awaiting the return of her husband, a pot of stew warming on the stove. On this particular evening, she felt more than usual amount of concern. Slade had been due hours before. Real quick, I know this is in the middle of a tense spot, but I'm gonna show this image, which is Maria Virginia Slade, the wife of the notorious Jack Slade, this rare photograph of Virginia Slade from Timothy Golden Collection in Missoula, Montana, has not appeared in any previous publications. Timothy Golden Collection, Missoula, Montana. And here she is in a lovely dress. Looking good. That's interesting. They must have had to really dig when they were making this book to find a photo from history like this that has not been published before. And it is like a good, like, 
photo considering the time that as we go let's get back to it although she he seldom came home on time there was something different about this particular night as the darkness began to turn into dawn virginia started to pace the floor wrangling her hands the wind had increased to a howl and tree branches taped against the rock houses she peered out of the window, but there was no sign of old copper bottom and no dear husband to help off his horse. On the same, on that night, Slade had been warned to return home and sober up, or there would be hell to pay. Being Jack Slade, however, he refused. <laughs> Do you want to hear the... <laughs> Yes, Andy? Are you thirsty? Are you a thirsty boy? Should I get you some water? Or do you want attention? Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> let's uh, pick up where we left off. And yeah, the cat just wanted some water. He's a picky boy. He likes to drink it from the open running spout of the bathtub. So I had to turn on the bathtub for him. Anyway, where were we? On that same night, Slade had been warned to return home and sober up or there'd be hell to play. Hell to pay. Being Jack Slade, however, he refused. The matter was taken before the assembly and that verdict was death by hanging. Slade's best friend, Jim Kim Dadden, Kish Dadden, had pleaded in vain for banishment from that territory. Not a lynching. When he saw there was no hope for Slade, he sent a message to Virginia. As she sat and waited, Virginia had no way of knowing Slade's luck had run out, or that before that night was over, he would be on his knees begging for mercy, mercy he never received. When Virginia received the message, she saddled Billy Boy and distracted with love and fear, set out to save the object of her undivided affection. With all the skill of an experienced exquisition, she urged the great horses up that heavy grade to the mountain top. The road was steep and rocky, dangerous as high, at high speed, but she did not hesitate. Down the declining, she plunged regardless of the danger to herself and her horse. The multitude saw her coming at breakneck speed, her raven tresses blown by the strong wind, despite her hesitate. Virginia had arrived too late. Slade was dead and her life as well as his was over. The last word upon his lips had been, oh, my dear wife. It was said his friends wept bitterly. Had Virginia arrived in time, she might have been able to save her husband. She was an expert shot by the people respected her. Virginia bravely faced the unruly mob and with tears streaming down her cheeks, she sobbed. Why, oh, why didn't one of you shoot him and not let him endure the shame of being hanged? If I had been here, I would have done it no dog's death should come to such a man. He did not deserve to die on that skull fold. Then she flung herself upon her husband's lifeless body. From that day forward, Virginia felt hatred for the people of Montana. She purchased a zinc coffin and preserved his remains in alcohol. He was temporarily buried across from the rock house. Were she, where she could look out at the site. Later, Virginia had Slade's remains taken to Salt Lake City and interred in the old Mormon cemetery. She did not want her husband to rest among his enemies. During her long months of grief, Jim Kiskaden became Virginia's constant companion and eventually her husband. Their marriage, however, was a disaster, for no man could ever replace Jack Slade. Her body would always ache for his embrace and the touch of his lips. 
It was almost more than she could even endure. Virginia left both Kiskaden and Montana behind. She had no longer cared for what happened. She no longer cared what happened. The high-spirited, handsome woman who had once been a loving, decent wife returned from whence she came. She was discovered a few years later running a brothel. Her life had come full circle. Virginia died shortly thereafter alone with nothing of value save the memories of Jack Slade, which she would carry with her throughout eternity. Years later, Slade's associates said they believed he did not commit a single act that was not justified by the circumstance provoking it. Although Lady Luck dealt Molly Forrest, Lottie Abs Pickett, and Virginia Slade a losing hand in the game of life, there was nothing more pathetic than the older prostitute who had lost her beauty and charm. She knew men no longer desired her. They only visited to fulfill a need. These women became even more dependent upon alcohol or opioids to ease their pain. Many left the larger cities drifting to the barren frontier communities. This move, however, may not have been to their advantage as the end of their trial for a frontier prostitute was the hog ranch. These miserable establishments were located along the major thoroughfares, such as the Bozeman Trail and the Chenin to Deadwood stage route. They came at a time when men were plentiful and women were scarce. Although the hog ranch provided a little desertion for the males, there was a little affection for the females employed there. These dens of inquiry offered cheap liquor, gambling, and women. The buildings were not fancy. They ranged from sod huts and dugouts to more elaborate concrete shacks. The clientele considered of cowboys, mule skinners, bull whackers, and soldiers. The shady lady's statue was governed mainly by her customer and the men these women served were just about at the bottom. Since soldiers earned about $13 a month, it would appear these soiled doves had reached the lowest rung of their profession. On a daily basis, these women dealt with drunks, gunfires, and killings. They were a tough group, were not bed-decked in silks and satin. The majority were unattractive and well past their prime, wearing clothing that consisted of bed-raggled costumes from better days and older soldiers' uniforms. In 1877, an L.T. John G. Brook visited the Hog Ranch at Fort Lamy and wrote in a letter, Three miles from Fort Lamy, there was a nest of ranches. Keeley and Scofies and Wright's tenant by a hardened and deprived a set of witches as could be found on the face of the globe. Each of these establish establishments was equipped with a run of the worst kind and each contained from three to half a dozen Krypton, Krippins virgins whose lamps were always burning brightly and in expectancy of coming of the bridegroom and who lured to destruction soldiers of the gallons in all my experience i have never seen a lower more beastly set of people of both sexes it was in this hog ranch west of Fort Laramie that the notorious calamity Jane reputedly worked for a brief period. Several historical books and newspapers show calamity was the, at the ranch in 1875 and again later in her life. She was a tough woman who often was the consort of soldiers, of soldiers teamsters, bullwhackers, and other disreparable men. Calamity used to boast that she was thrown out of a brothel in Bozeman, Montana for 
being a low influence on the inmates. <laughs> now that's, that's a quote. It was said by saloon keepers that Calamity was part of the overhead of the saloon she frequented. Although Calamity Jane had been described as an outlaw liar, gambler, and prostitute, there was another side to her story. She was also a kind, generous woman who willingly helped during a disaster or epidemic. Calamity's childhood was not like that of the other children. Her mother, Charlotte, was a bold, flamboyant woman with a love for alcohol and men. Calamity's father was a successful man in awe of his wife and who referred to as the toast of half the, the I don't know if I can read that, the toast of half the barons and native fighters from Walla Walla to Dodge City. As a small girl, Calamity grew up unsupervised, running with a rowdy pack of boys who taught her to down raw whiskey without coughing. At the age of 12, she would stand in the, bar in the barroom doors and laugh at coarse jokes she didn't understand. Calamity's lessons of life came from brothels, dance halls, and opium dens. Her dreams for the future were to run with the husky frontiersmen. By the time Calamity was 15, she had become a rough-mannered young woman with her mother's coppery hair and an appetite for embaldy pleasures. She could use a 30-foot bullwhacker's whip, drive a team, and ride a horse as well as any man. Calamity preferred the open plains and the rough towns of the West. She wore teamster's clothing imitated by their swagger and laughter with sheer abandon at obscene stories. Calamity also shared her blanket with many men. She had constant need for masculine companionship and was considered a good-natured camp trollop. While the perfumed fancy ladies charged for their favors, Calamity bestowed hers free of charge unless she needed the money. At the age of 24, Calamity was a confined alcoholic who supported herself by fretting to different camps with her bull team. The only woman friends she had were in the red light districts. She had become a hell-raising female who established her right to drink in any bar that was reserved exclusively for men and scorned the dance houses for the uh, demimonde. If a bartender true if a bartender turned calamity away there would be plenty of the boys who would back her up saying that's calamity jane he gruffled replies was damn right it's calamity while in albrin calamity changed into a feminine figure for a brief period she claimed to be the innocent daughter of gambler Allegheny Dick and wore her fancy gowns with an elegance that surprised everyone. She was highly regarded for her gentle bearings and admired by the cowhands coming in with droves up from Texas. They gave her the flattering title of Prairie Queen. This phrase, however, was short-lived. Calamity once again downed her masculine attire, saddled up her horse, and headed for Cheyenne. Although Calamity Jane was known throughout the West, no one really knew her. She loved many men, but was never loved in return. Her affection for Wild Bill Hickok lasted throughout her lifetime. Hickok was a Western hero who reputedly killed at least a dozen men in his capacity as a frontier marshal and gambler. He dressed in fancy buckskins with a Stairston hat wore his hair long and sported a mustache. Hickok knew Calamity's love for him, but he considered her to only be a friend, and on many occasions a nuisance. When he was shot, she was heartbroken and claimed he had been her lover. Calamity Jane was a Western legend. Her life had been dramatized by tabloids, newspapers, and dying novels. Many of the tales are true, but were told by Calamity herself. She drifted throughout the territories, a lonely female misfit who worked at a man's job when it was suited for her, and as a prostitute when things got tough. 
Calamity lived a tragic, unconventional life. I did not fit into her era. It had been said she was a woman who was born 50 years before her time. In 1903, at the age of about 51, Calamity Jane died a broken down old dialect. She was appreciated by all, but respected by few. The citizens of Deadwood bury her legend in style with the largest, gaudiest funeral the town had seen. Calamity Jane was buried beside her unacquainted love, Wild Bill Hickok. She would have been pleased. And we have, courtesy of Kansas State Historical Society, Tilth, Kansas. Timberline, this Dutch city prostitute was known throughout the Western frontier. And we have a photo on this side. And with that, oh, we have more photos. We have more photos. Okay. Let's go through some photos. There's a little bit left at the end here. A couple little notes. And then uh, chapter eight. So let's go ahead and look at these photos. Calamity Jane, this photograph of Calamity Jane shows how attractive she could be in a feminine attire. Courtesy of the Wyoming State Museum, Sharon Wyoming. And then we'll get to the one on the right. So there is Calamity Chain in women's gown attire. And we also have Calamity Jane wearing her buckskin and boots, holding the Winchester with which she appeared many times in books and magazine, courtesy of the Wyoming Museum. So we have her in feminine attire and then we have her in, in manly attire. So here's her in her manly attire. There's no way of really knowing in today's state, but it does make me wonder if she dressed as a man out of necessity or because it's who she felt she truly was. So it does make me wonder if in today's standards she would have considered herself non-binary or gender fluid to some extent. I don't know but it's fun to think about. <laughs> uh, we got courtesy of the Wyoming State Museum, Shine Wyoming, Wild Bill Hickok. Bill Hickok was the object of Calamity's affection. And this photo is not as nice uh, in quality sake. It's a bit grainy, but there he is with his mustache and all. Um, yeah, this is the Bill Hickok that was here. Object of affection. There he is. I'm gonna have a little sip of water and then we're gonna read this. After many years, after an absence of 10 or 11 years, the notorious Calamity Jane, who used to figure so predominantly in police courts and circles in the city, had again made her appearance in Cheyenne, but evidently in a very diplomatic condition, judging from what is said by those who have seen her. She was first seen here on Wednesday of this week and again on Thursday, but yesterday, so far as could be certain, she did not show herself on the streets. Calamity has had a checkered career and has for years been well known and not only here, but a SIC, sick deadward deck and many other towns in the far west, and it is only a few months ago that her picture appeared in one of the New York Illustrated Police Papers, and that is from the Democratic Leaders, uh, the Democratic Leader, March 12, 1887. And then we're gonna read Jane's Jamboree. On Sunday, June 10th, the notorious female Calamity Jane greatly rejoiced over her release from the Durance Vile uh, procured a horse and buggy from Jass. Abney Stable, this is a weird sentence, okay. 
Abney Stable obscenely to drive to Fort Russell and back. By the time she had reached the fort, however, indulgence in them, frequent and liberal portions completely befogged her. Not very clear brain. And she drove right by that place, never drawing rein until she reached the chug. 50 miles dis distinct. Continuing to uh, imbibe bug juice at close intervals and in large quantities throughout the night, she woke up ne the next morning with a vague idea that Fort Brussels had been removed. But being still bent on finding it, she drove on, finally sighting Fort Larney, 90 miles district. Reaching there, she had discovered her mistake, but didn't show much disappointment. She turned her horse out to grass, ran the buggy into a corral, and began enjoying life in camp after her usual fashion. When Joe Racken reached the fort several days later, she begged of him to not arrest her. And as she, as he had no authority to do so, he merely took charge of the Averney outfit, which was brought back to the city Sunday, the Cheyenne Daily, June 20th, 1878. All right, and then there's a photo, and the next chapter is The Chinese Slave Girl's Life Without Hope. And I think that is nearing the end. Okay, no, then there's... There's chapter eight, there's chapter nine. Okay, so we have a few more chapters. And then, yeah, okay. There's chapter eight and chapter nine. And that looks where we will put in our bookmark for today. I hope you've enjoyed this reading of Soiled Doves Prostitution in the Early West, chapter seven. Um, Please let me know what you think. I understand it's a... It's a hard topic to listen to and go over the gruesome details. So I appreciate you listening and reading this book with me. I hope you're enjoying it. I find it really, really fascinating. And it's nice to just hear about history. I, I like history books like this. So yeah, please like, comment, subscribe, hit the little bell notification and have a good one. Bye.